So, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining today's session. I'm Sean Gibb. I'm the Events and Marketing Manager at Pro Manchester. I'm delighted to welcome you to When Can I Afford to Retire, hosted by Pareto Financial Planning Limited. Following today's session, I'll send out a post-event email, which will contain any post-event collateral, links to where you can find out more, uh, and also links to where you can find out about future Pro Manchester events. And our feedback form, if you can take two minutes to fill in this very short feedback form, really does help us, um, helps give uh, feedback back to, back to Stuart and the team, and also um, helps us, you know, consistently provide great content. There's a question on there about giving your ideas about some of the events you'd like to see, so please do feed it back, it's all good stuff. Just a couple of points of housekeeping, please be aware that this session is being recorded. Feel free to use the chat function to ask any questions, make any comments, observations, and we'll address those towards the end. There'll also be an opportunity towards the end to come off mute and you can ask your questions directly. But yeah, if you just keep yourself on mute for the time being. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Stuart Carswell, Director of Pareto Financial Planning Limited. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Sean. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, this webinar on when can I afford to retire. And when we're talking about when can I afford to retire, what we're really looking at is how do we maintain um, a standard of living, either in retirement, on succession or exit of our business. If you're looking at going through a divorce um, or personal injury trusts, uh, clinical negligence trusts, and just being able to say, going forward, given my standard of living that I'm looking for, how will I be able to afford to maintain that and what's the impact that will have on my capital and assets. So, excuse me, I'm getting this moving forward. That was working before. So the agenda for the presentation today, um, we'll be looking at who Pareto are, and just touch on the services that we offer. Then we'll look at the foundations of financial planning, have a look at how cash flow planning and cash flow modeling can assist with that. And what I will say is cash flow planning, cash flow planning, excuse me, should be used as a tool to assist advice. It shouldn't be the driver for advice. Um, and then we'll have a look at how cash flow planning works. Excuse me, we've got some people coming in. Um, and then we'll run through a case study and just seeing um, how, in reality, cash flow planning can work in real life. So with regards to who we are, Pareto Financial Planning and an IFA, um, Independent Financial Advisors, excuse the acronym, based in Manchester, Northwest based, and we specialise in working with professional connections, but in particular, accountancy practices. 90% of our clients are owner-managed business, therefore we understand how owner managed businesses, shareholding directors work, and all too often when people are looking at maintaining the, sta uh, maintaining the standard of living going forward, be that on exit or on retirement. Advisors sometimes won't take into account the client's most valuable asset, which is usually the business, more valuable than, uh, than their pension, more valuable than their, than their um, houses. So how do we incorporate that into assisting clients working out how they're able to afford to retire and when they can actually afford to retire as well? In terms of size, Pareto, we have over £1 billion worth of assets under management, over 60 staff, of which 19 are advisors, and that incorporates our employee benefits departments. And we're one of only two IFAs in the Northwest that have been ranked in the top 50 FT advisors in the country. In terms of what we do, um, we, as I mentioned before, we look after corporate clients and also private clients. And how we go about giving advice is we'll look at where clients are today, where they want to be in the future, sit down and discuss with those the various options that are open to our clients. Then we'll formulate a plan. And then after we've formulated it and put it in writing, um, after a discussion, we can look at implementing any areas of advice the client wishes to look at. But the most important part of any financial planning is having a look at the reviews. Um, so once we do implement any plans, it's the ongoing advice because circumstances change and this is where cash flow planning comes in to its own. How any, um, any plans that we have put in place can adapt and change to clients changing circumstances. 
In terms of the areas we look at, obviously it's protection, which is the foundations of financial planning. We'll all, we also give advice on pensions, investments and savings, estate and inheritance tax planning. And as I mentioned before, we've also got some employee benefits department that have a look at companies, pension schemes, death and service, private medical and um, income protection. In terms of where we get our income from, unlike a lot of IFAs, we do try and give holistic advice. When I say holistic, across the board. So 20, roughly 25% of our um, income comes from employee benefits, 25% from protection planning, both corporates and also personal, 25% pensions and 25% investments. I know there's 5% mortgages. We personally don't give mortgage advice, but we do have um, contacts that we can um, give refer out to if anyone needs any um, mortgage advice. So as I say, we do try and give holistic advice, but when we come to individual recommendations, that's bespoke, depending upon a client's circumstances and needs. So in terms of moving forward and giving advice, um, the most important part is making sure that clients have the basics, the foundations in place to move forward. Only 10% of clients have a will and power of attorney in place, which is fundamental. Um, if something happens to an individual, where do they want their estate? How do we want their estate to be administered? But also more importantly, while they're still alive and maybe incapable of making decisions, how they wish um, for their lifestyle to be maintained and also that of their partners. Then we have a look at protecting assets and liabilities, making sure that these are set up as tax efficiently as possible by looking at certain things um, such as trusts, and also making sure that we review these on a regular basis. All too often we see that um, protection plans are set up and they haven't been reviewed, so they're out of sync with what they were looking to achieve originally. And once you've got the foundations in place, then we can start looking at um, building a future. And how we go about building a future is looking at how are you going to maintain your standard of living going forward? And the big question is, how much is enough? How much is enough to, will depend upon what you're looking to do in retirement or when you sell your business or going through um, your financial settlement and a divorce. So the big question I would ask everyone is, think about if you were to start working tomorrow, again, be that retirement, selling the business, um, or if, if you're going through um, a matrimonial split, and then price up what you're looking to do in today's money, and then you can start looking at forward planning, how much capital that you would actually need to maintain that standard of living. So what is cash flow planning? Well, essentially cash flow planning is a tool that we can use to assist on modeling forward the income required to maintain that standard of living. And all we're looking at doing is, what is a client's assets and liabilities today? What's the client's income expenditure today? What are the client's assets and liabilities in the future? And what income and expenditure do the clients require um, in the future? And based on certain assumptions, we can model growth and the impact of income being taken to sustain that um, standard of living and the effects of that it will have on capital. So what is cash flow planning used for? Well, essentially, we have to look at making sure that clients have enough assets to maintain that standard of living going forward. But also circumstances change. I've got, a, um, as I mentioned, I've got a case study um, that we'll run through going forward. And we can have a look at the impact on what happens if client circumstances change or alternatively, what happens if certain assumptions change, such as inflation, um, market risks, and if returns are either higher or lower than what we um, originally modelled through. Once we know that and the impact it has on future capital, we can also use it to look to mitigate tax and also use clients' allowances going forward. I've got a client that we've modelled through, taking roughly £10,000, or will be taking £10,000 per month um, as an income from various sources and using up various allowances and structures, he's able to currently taking out £10,000 per month and you'll be paying 0% tax. Now, some of that will be tax deferred, but by using cash flow planning, we can model through the impact of tax on future income uh, going forward. 
We can also model what's the um, uh, potential surplus and shortfall and assist with um, some tax planning and then look at what happens if certain scenarios happen going forward and how minor changes may impact income, expenditure, and also uh, capital going forward in the future. So how does cash flow planning work? Well, essentially the first step is to sit down and look at clients' income, expenditure, savings, and assets, and then determine secondly, what their future needs, priorities, and objectives are. Once we've done that, we can look at discussing different lifestyle events um, in different scenarios. So there may be things such as children getting married, um, big birthdays on the horizon. There might be um, capital coming in from inheritance or sale of a business on earnouts, as you'll see in the cash and in the case study. And once we know that, then we can project forward the standard of living and the impact that um, changes in income and expenditure, excuse me, can have on future capital requirements. And once we've got that model, Oh, the, excuse me, the projections, then we can model forward different scenarios. So what happens if? And we can have a look at what happens if we go through um, a crisis such as we have done since March 2020, which we'll all be aware of. But also we can have a look at what happens if there's a market crash as it was back in 2008 and what impact that can have on people's future capital, income and expenditure. And then once we've had a look at the different scenarios, we can look at the client's different options and quantify numbers on how much is required to achieve that standard of living clients are looking for in retirement. What we don't have is stage seven on this plan, which is one of the most important, which is the constant review to make sure what we've put in place is still, um, uh, still appropriate for the client's needs, priorities and objectives as they change going forward into the future. So we've got a quick video that we'll just run. Cash flow planning is the process of looking at your current financial situation and planning ahead for the future. Think of it like a sat-nav in the car. Not only will it help you understand where you are and where you want to go, it will highlight all possible options and help with any potential roadblocks along the way. Cash flow planning works on the same principle. Goodbye complex spreadsheets full of numbers and welcome powerful, concise visual graphs. If you do want more detailed information, a comprehensive report combines everything you're looking for and more, empowering you to make the right decision and do things you've always wanted. Obviously, I designed all of that. Um, so if we just have a look at a real life case study, obviously names have been changed to protect the innocent, but we have a client who was looking at selling some of the shares in his business for three million pound. Um, he's married, 55 years old, his wife is 53 years old, all children are independent. He was getting 50% of the three million pound up front and then 25% on an earn out over um, the next five years. And over the next five years, he was tied into the company and he was getting an income of five and a half thousand pounds per month net um, and also 40,000 pounds per year being utilised into his pension for his annual allowance purposes. Once he hit 60, he was planning on fully retiring. The first tranche of the, the sellout, the, um, the 1.5 million pound, he was just sat money, cash in bank. He had a little bit of savings saved up um, historically, both him and his wife had existing pensions, nothing extravagant. He was expecting a fixed thing, uh, sorry, a fixed expenditure of three and a half thousand pounds per month. And up until he retired, he expected variable expenditure of five thousand pounds per month, and that reducing then down to three and a half thousand. So, total eight and a half thousand pounds per month up until retirement, and then seven thousand pounds per month from age 60. Onwards, we use a life expectancy rate of 90, but according to the Office of the National Statistics, that would be around about 82 or 83 for himself and 87 for Barbara. And he was wanting to know if this was sustainable. Would the capital be able to maintain the standard of living that he was looking for going forward? So excuse me one moment, if I can just go to... 
So the assumptions that we made on this, the, the inflation rate we were using it was at 2.5. And as we know, inflation over the last couple of months has been over the 3% mark. There's discussions today and an expectation that interest rates may move up by between 0.1 and 0.25%. So again, when we're highlighting the changes in client circumstances and the assumptions we make on the reviews, it's so important to make sure that we do include those and see what the impact that would be. And I can model this through um, on a live experiment, um, the impact that an increase in inflation would have with this client. So nothing so complicated, the client had £10,000 in his current accounts. He had £1.6 million, pounds, give or take, um, in his Barclays account, of which one point five was from the sale of the company shares. His wife had £350,000 sat in her bank account, and she described that as her running away fund. Um, he had six hundred. Uh, Andrew had £650,000 sat in a personal pension, and Barbara had £350,000. So again, nothing too extravagant. In terms of income, as I mentioned, he was, received, he was going to receive £5,500 net per month. And then at 67, his state pension would kick in. And when he is 69, Barbara's state pension would kick in. In terms of outgoings, as I mentioned, £3,500 per month fixed expenditure for life. And then on top of that, he would have £5,000 per month up until he retires at 60, or he's expecting to retire, and three and a half thousand pounds per month from his retirement date. In terms of future contributions, it was 40,000 pounds per year going into his pension, the Scottish Widows from the company as part of his earnouts, and then he'd receive 750,000 um, pounds in two years and four years time, assuming certain conditions were met. And then we also had a withdrawal of around about £5,000 that he wanted to put away for capital gains tax purposes. In terms of fees, we were looking at half a percent a year for our ongoing advice and all the returns we were looking at the net of external charges. At Pareto, we don't run any of our own funds. We're totally independent. We've got no conflicts. We will, put, uh, we will get an investment manager to look after individual clients' investments while we give the financial planning advice. But because we have over a billion pounds worth of funds on the management, we've been able to negotiate with just fees with a lot of the investment managers out there. So having a look at the cash flow modelling in terms of money in, and all cash flow modelling is, when we're seeing in the video, um, we can do away with Excel spreadsheets. All cash flow modelling is, is an Excel spreadsheet that gives us a nice graph. And it looks at assets, and assets liabilities, income expenditure today, assets, liabilities, income expenditure in the future, and it will model it through. So with this client, we can see the income that the client's expecting over five years, the expenditure of £500,000 for his tax bill, and the black line is perceived expenditure, dropping down post-retirement, and the light green shaded area that's the deficit that required from income to cover the expenditure going forward. The red line is state pension for Andrew, and the amber line is the state pension for Barbara. So what impact would that have with Andrew and Barbara over time? Well, you can see here modeling it through, in terms of assets, the client would have 2.95 million pound today, at age 60, when he retires, he would have £4.2 million worth of assets. Excuse me, I should have mentioned before, that's based on 5% um, linear growth, so 5% net growth from his pension scheme. He, he was a, cash, uh, a risk profile 7 on a scale of 1 to 10. So savings at retirement, age 60, £4.2 million, and savings on death, um, assuming death rate, excuse me, mortality rate at age 92.3 million pound. But as we mentioned before, we expect inflation to increase. So if we increase the inflation rate to 4%, what would the impact of that be on Andrew and Barbara's capital? Again, 2.9 million pound today. It reduces total capital and assets to 3.9 million pound. 
and at age 90, the estate would be left with a million pound. If we increase that to five and a half percent, then you can see the, the, the total capital from Andrew and Barbara would virtually totally erode by the age that they're 90. And if we extended their life expectancy to 100, then potentially they could run out of capital. So what we said, we sat down and, and they were getting 0% in the bank accounts. So again, exactly the same uh, assumption, excuse me, that should be 2.5, 2.5. Life expectancy, Andrew, at age 90, £10,000 in the conference accounts. And all we looked at doing is take a million pounds from Andrew's deposit account, put that into a general investment account, an investment account to use up the allowances. We set up two ICEs and everything else is exactly the same. And we've assumed 5%, again, net return on his investments. Income and expenses are exactly the same. So no difference to maintaining standard of living. And in terms of contributions and withdrawals, all we're doing is funding Andrew and Barbara's ISAs. That's coming from the general investments accounts. The same £40,000 being contributed into the pension, the same earn out. And again, the £20,000 contribution into the ISA is coming from the general investment, the, his investments account. Again, 0.5% ongoing fees. And what impact would that have on the investments? Money in, money out. So again, you've got exactly the same expenditure, but now you've got different contributions because the ISAs are being, um, are being contributed to. But what impact would that have on a client's capital over time? Well, it increases from 2.9 million pound to 5. Point, well, just just under uh, just over five, five and a quarter million pounds, as opposed to leaving it in the bank and having 2.3 million. Now, if we start having a look at the set of scenarios we discussed before, increasing it inflation to 4%, that five million pound would reduce down to 2.5. And if we increase it to five and a half percent, assuming based on all the assumptions that we've made, they would still have an estate of 1.1 million pound at age 90 in today's money. The other thing that was um, concerning Andrew is what happened if the earn out, the conditions weren't met for the earn out. So again, exactly the same details. However, same assumptions being made. Savings pots exactly the same. Income and expenses, contributions and withdrawals. All we have here is that there aren't the earn outs in, in two years' time and four years' time, charges and fees exactly the same. What impact would that have on the client's capital? Again, £2.9 million, pound, but instead of the 2.2, the capital um, at age 90 would reduce down to £1.1 £1 .1 million. Pound. But if we increase inflation to 4% on this scenario with money held in the bank, Again, the client would only have just over £150,000 um, with the life expectancy at 90. And if we increase the inflation rate to 5%, the client's money would run out. Big Andrew is age 86 and Barbara is 84. And bearing in mind, life expectancy for Barbara would be 87. That potentially could be an issue. So in real life terms, that's exactly how cash flow modeling can work. And again, I could run through the no I now on the proposed um, with what we were looking at. 2.4 million pound, if we increase inflation to 4%, the impact that would have. And increase it to 5%. On this scenario, without the earn out, the client would still have money when Andrew is age 90. So, with regards to the case study, you can see how cash flow modeling can help a client look to retire or maintain the standard of living. We've also used this 
um, quite a lot with our accountants when they're looking at trying to find out how much is enough on the sale of a business. Um, we had a client working with one of our corporate finance partners. They were looking for £6 million. Um, I mean, they were expecting £6 million. Pounds. That's what we were uh, discussing. But we modelled through exactly what they required. Um, they needed £7 million pound up front and they were just earn out. The corporate finance partner was able to go back to the purchaser and they negotiated more up front and less in the earn out because there was something that we, we were able to justify on behalf of the vendor why they needed that extra money um, up front. Excuse me, sorry. Let me try and get back to... Let me get rid of this, excuse me. Just move this back up. So what are the benefits of cash flow planning? Well, it's there to quantify and project the impact of certain scenarios based on certain assumptions going forward. But those assumptions will change. And it's important to make sure that we sit down and hold regular reviews and we can model through changes in assumptions. What I didn't show you, excuse me, was the impact of a market crash. And we can model through the impact of a market crash, which have, can have a significant impact to client's capital. Um, it also highlights where there are potential shortfalls. It helps us manage clients' finances going forward and also helps us to manage potential funding caps, but not only funding caps, but also what happens if there's uh, on surpluses. Do we need to speak to um, some private client solicitors and have a look at setting things up in trust to make sure that there's, um, we're just taxed to pay, God forbid, when both clients pass away? So when should cash flow planning be used? We should be looking at succession planning and exit planning with um, entrepreneurs or the managed businesses, how to quantify how much is enough when they're looking to retire. Also looking at retirement planning, and that may be um, before state retirement age and having a look at the impact, taking, maintaining that standard of living once income stops will have on people's capital and assets going forward. It's also very useful when we're talking about how do we quantify how much is enough when clients are going through a divorce or a marital split. And it's also important looking at estate planning on how we can mitigate tax going forward for people's estates. And one of the things that, that we should, um, that I mentioned before and we should emphasize is it is a tool to enable us to be able to model forward the advice that we're giving. And regular reviews are probably the most important part of that. Circumstances change. So if you think about Andrew and Barbara, He's 55, life expectancy 84. That's roughly 30 years in the future. If you go back 30 years and think about how much his lifestyles change um, and how much his capital and circumstances have changed, he's got the same amount of change for the next 30 years. So it shows you how uh, how we need, excuse me, it shows you how we need to ensure that the plans that we put in place are as flexible as possible to adapt to those changes. Legislation changes, um, we've already, we know that currently at the moment we're, the UK is over two trillion pounds in debt. There's only four ways that we can reduce that debt, increase taxes, decrease expenditure, inflationary measures, which will be an unofficial government policy. They're quite happy with inflation being higher because that allows us to inflate away out of government debt and also growth. And we've seen some of the impacts with Rishi Sunak and his budget um, about some of the impacts he's looking at doing for VCTs and EISs to encourage growth. And again, regular reviews are essential because we're basing this on certain assumptions, assumptions such as inflation, on growth, and also um, volatility. So it leads me to thank you for your time this morning. That was a stopgap tour of cash flow modeling and how it can benefit clients for exiting businesses, um, retirement, matrimonial splits and personal injury trusts. But all that we're talking about is using that to model through the impact of taking benefits and how that will affect people's capital and assets going forward.
So if I can invite Sean, if there are any any um, any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Thanks, Stuart. That was great. Really appreciated. Um, please, everyone, um, submit your questions or come off mute and ask. Have a chat with Stuart. Ask your questions. That's easy. <laughs> it's an easy audience this morning. Was everyone at the Business Awards last night? Was it a late night? <laughs> everyone staying quiet. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, so I don't know if this is exactly the same as what we've been discussing, but if you were to take out um, instructions for uh, last will and testament, power of attorney, um, maybe set up some sort of family trust fund with a um, solicitors or financial planners, and then that firm goes into administration, what, what kind of are your options then? What should you be doing then? Well, in terms of if the financial planners or the solicitors go into administration. Yeah, and you've got all of your documents tied up with them. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the insolvency firm would come in and hopefully there'd be a purchase. I mean, hopefully you're not implying anything about Pareto there, Sean. <laughs> not at uh, all, not at all. Um, the, I mean, all, all wills and power of attorneys would be held with the solicitors. It's not something we get involved in. We don't write those. What we will do is we use, it's one of the first questions we ask in our fact find when we're discussing things with clients. Have you made a will? Have you made a power of attorney? And also, have you made a business will? Have you made a business power of attorney? And we would look to refer that to the legal contacts and our legal partners that we would use, um, some of which are here today. So thank you for joining. Um, and they, I mean, obviously, the, the, it doesn't matter if the, um, uh, when you say it doesn't matter, if a legal firm has become insolvent, the will is still standing. Thing, and hopefully those clients would be taken over by another, by another firm. We physically don't hold any wills or power of attorneys. We don't make wills or power of attorneys. We don't give advice on it. What we will do is we will sit down with our legal partners and with all the information that we've got on assets and liabilities and what clients' future plans are for maintaining the standard of living. We like to think that between ourselves, the solicitors, the clients, and, and also the accountants sometimes. I mean, we were talking about succession planning. Um, if, you, if it's a trading company and certain conditions are met, the value of that company for inheritance tax purposes will be at 0%. But in this scenario, in the case study I just ran through, the client sold £1.5 million pounds worth of his, um, his business. And that drops into the state straight away. I've got a client who sold his business for over 50 million pounds and because it was a trading company, it's a hefty sum that goes into his estate straight away. So there's a lot of things that we can do to look at mitigating inheritance tax and protecting that for intergenerational planning. But um, thankfully, not too many solicitors or IFAs of our size go into insolvency. Thank you. That's a good answer. Thank you very much. Um, another question here. What is your best advice for retirement planning for someone who is under 30? Start it. Start planning straight away. I mean, obviously, you've got auto-enrollment schemes that are out there that your employer has to provide, um, and you're putting in the minimum for it. Um, for every year you leave it, for, you defer being a member into a pension scheme. To get the equivalent in retirement, you have to increase your contributions by around about 8%. So if you leave it for five years, it's a 40% increase in contributions. So even start it as early as possible. I've got three daughters and I've got a wee pension pot for them because they still get basically tax relief, even though they're no rate taxpayers. Um, they've just got a little pension scheme that, that they'll be paying to. They're not going to thank me for it, but it's better that than them having a lump sum at 18 and 21, because I know what I did with, when I got my lump sum on the 21st birthday, my mum didn't see me for about 18 months. <laughs> so start off as early as possible, but also think about when you're looking to retire. We know the state pension age is increasing to 67. We know 
the minimum age that you can take your private pension is increasing from 55 to 57. So the only way, if we think about why pension, the state pension came in um, uh, into play with the, uh, the welfare state, was people from the Second World War, the people, you know, it was a way of gifting back to, to we're coming up to Armistice Day, people who fought in the war and were giving something back. But bearing in mind, most people started work and started paying national insurance at 16, 18, retired at 65, and mortality rates were 68. So the government had roughly 40 years worth of national insurance in tight um, being contributed. Now what's happening is most people go to sick form and university and people are looking to retire early. So the, the amount of money that's being contributed to government to pay for pension is reducing, but people are living longer, so the liability on the government is lasting longer. So something has to be done, hence why auto enrollment schemes were brought in. So it's it's an opt-out as opposed to stakeholder schemes, which are an opt-in, and lethargy is one of the biggest barriers to financial planning. No one wakes up on a Monday morning and says, I'm going to go shopping for a pension this weekend. They just, they just don't. It's, it's not something that tickles the fancy, because with we're advising on something that's not tangible. So life cover isn't tangible. Investments aren't tangible. So no one physically wants to do that a lot of the time. It's more a necessity. And then really when you reach the age of 40, and I know this because I'm, I'm 47, that's when um, you, you, you start thinking about what if, how much is enough? When am I going to retire? And sometimes by that time, it's too late. If you think about the circle of life, obviously born at zero, can't do anything about pensions for the first 20 years because you're in education. You retire at 60, life expectancy is 80, so you can't do anything about pensions from 60 to 80. So you've only got 40 years to be able to contribute to a plan to live off 20. Now, if you leave that till age 40, you've only got 20 years to contribute for a life expectancy of 20 years. Simple maths, it's 50-50. That isn't because you've got tax relief and return, et cetera, but simple maths. So start as early as possible. Get advice. Absolutely. Probably see me. <laughs> um, someone said on the, on the video that you played, uh, it mentioned things like holidays, property purchases and sales. Yeah. How and where do they figure into the cash flow model? Ah, right. So, excuse me again. If I just go back to my screen. So, if we go back to the proposed. This is the client's proposed on the earn out, um, taking the million pound, put it into, putting it into, uh, it's gone. just bear with me, I need to share my screen, don't I? So, we'll go back to the um, cash flow planning. So, proposed model. This is the client where we're taking a million pound, put it into an investment account that will fund future ISAs going forward. And if we have a look at withdrawals, what we can say is um, if we had a withdrawal being, let's say, holiday of run the world cruise, 50,000 pound, one off when the client is 60, coming from Let's say, you might want to use the, the deposit account, but let's say it comes out of the um, general investment account and adjust for today's inflation. So we've added in the holiday. Um, here. And if we just add in, let's say, uh, a withdrawal. 30,000 pounds. And again, no one knows when the DOS is going to get married, but if you just put in 63, and again, add it from today's inflation, take it out of the general investment account. And then if we model that through, to go back to money in, money out. Excuse me. Uh, inflation. Adjusted, yep. Sorry, I've still got inflation rates up. At... 
there, and we can see here, that's the holiday at age 60, 50,000 pound, adjusted for inflation at 2.5%, and this is for retirement. In terms of the impact it has, you can see the impact it has on savings at um, mortality rates. What I didn't do, now that it's up, what we can do is say, well, what happens if there's a market crash? And if we choose a custom time frame, 2007, so pre-2008, and we look for 10 years, starting when the client's age 62, so two years after retirement, and that would affect the pension, the ISA, And if we run that simulated event, this is the crash, this is the rebound, this is the institutions taking things out of the market. So exactly what happened from 2000 and, excuse me, 2007 to 2017, if we run that simulation, apply the changes, then go back to the, graph. So we can see here, this is the crash, the rebound, the crash, and the impact that would have. And you can see it can be quite significant on the client's capital um, at, age, at, age, um, at age 90. Sorry, just bear with me. But what we can also do is create a report and we can put in the current plan, And then we can prepare a report and we would put this in the recommendation and it shows everything that we discussed in terms of inflation, total savings at the start, at age 60, age 90, savings pots, the contributions and withdrawals, charges and fees, expenses coming out. It runs the forecast of income and the savings over time. And we can use that as a comparison to the one that we've just run, including the market crash and the withdrawals of the holiday and the wedding. Excuse me, is that okay? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, next but question. Very interactive. I mean, we, we can sit down, and if, if anyone's got any clients that they wish me to run through this or any of the advisors that we have at Pareto, it's quite easy. It's quite a simple process. We can sit there and have a look at assets, liabilities, income, expenditures, sit there with clients and model their retirement, make, looking at maintaining their standard of living, or for any of their clients going forward. And we can sit down with clients once we have that information and play about with different figures. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, next question. What do you make of the retire now, work later movement? And are you getting more requests from people to cash flow model on that basis? Yeah, I mean, but the, the, the heading was, when can I afford to retire? And I mean, it used to be my retirement was all about taking an income from a pension, buying an annuity. So when my mum was looking to retire, it was build up a pension pot and buy an annuity. And she had a specific age in mind. But we've got lots of clients nowadays who, there's lots of different pots of pensions, just one part of providing an income in the time. We've already mentioned sale of a business. You've got inheritance, you've got buy to lets, you've got downsizing your house. Then people have got different views on um, what they should be doing, when they should be retiring. And a lot of the time it's a soft retirement. So clients look at reducing down to four days a week, three, three days a week. And then even once they have retired, looking at doing some consultancy work or having the hand in or having some investments and um, other ways of maintaining income we can build that into the model that we're looking at so if someone's got some consultancy work and they might be getting a thousand pounds per month we can build that in and we can also have a look at ways of mitigating paying income tax on that wonderful um Every individual circumstances are different, but as a rule of thumb, what percentage of your income should you try to retire at each stage of your 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on? Yeah, it's, 
I mean, it, it, that's crystal ball time. It, it, it's impossible to say. Well, I mean, there used to be, God, when I started out, I'm going back well, to 1997, they had the uh, percentage contributions of what you could pay of your salary into a pension. Now you can pay 100% of your earned income up to certain limits, up to £40,000 a year, assuming your income's under £210,000. So, I mean, it, it, it's impossible to say. It's the main thing that I that I would advise all clients to do is genuinely sit down. Oh, my, my retirement plans at age 55, this is going out to the world now. So if you speak to our chief exec, he, um, I might have a difficult conversation this afternoon. But at 55, my kids will all have left university. I want to take my 25% tax-free cash. Genuinely, I want to buy a camper van and for 12 months, just travel around Europe. I might get bored after two, two months. I might get bored after four months. But that's what I plan to do. Now, I've worked out exactly how much that's going to cost. And then I've factored that in. I also want to then sell that and buy a two-bedroom place over in Spain and be able to go out to work in Spain for four, four uh, weeks in the summer and four weeks in the winter. So this, I, it's about planning how, what you're looking at doing, how much is that going to cost? And from there, you can work back. So there's two ways of going about it. You can say, I've got X amount of capital. How much income will that give me? And then work out your standard of living from the point. So you've got X amount of capital, that will give you Y amount of income, and that will give you the lifestyle of such and such. I think a much better way of doing it is saying, this is the standard of living I want. How much is that going to cost in today's terms? And therefore, you can work out how much capital you require. And it's a, it's a much better way of going about doing it. And then you've got the issue of opportunity cost. What you spend today, you're not going to have in the future. And everyone needs a standard of living today. And actually, the, the, you mentioned before, the earlier you start, the much better it is. And remember, pensions are probably the most tax efficient form of savings. The only problem with pension planning is you can't access it until you're 55, 57 for most people. So it's chicken and egg, Sean. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been a fascinating um, session. Uh, if there's no further questions, then uh, well, I will say thank you very much to Stuart. Thank you very much to Pareto. And thank you very much to all of you for attending. Um, and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sean. Thank you, Pro Manchester. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Have a great day.